I've never seen so many poets that I've heard of but never met in one room. Um, I picked uh, one that's kind of become a... It's a political poem that's kind of... Everyone always asks me to read, given the, the uh, cause and the topic and so on. My name is Kevin Higgins, and the poem I'm going to read for you is A Brief History of Those Who Made Their Point Politely and Then Went Home. On this day of tear gas in Seoul and windows broken at Dickens and Jones, I can't help wondering why a history of those who made their point politely and then went home has never been written. Those who, in the heat of the moment, never dislodged a policeman's helmet, never blocked the traffic or held a country to ransom. Someone should ask them, was it all worth it? All those proud men and women who never had the National Guard sent in against them, who left everything exactly as they found it, without adding as much as a scratch to the paintwork, who no one bothered asking, are you or have you ever been, because we all knew damn well they never ever were. For the first time there, uh, Kevin surprised me, <laughs> surprised us. Fortunately, the Ushta Galeer got tired of the Galeva, because he faded on our Shunta, the Galeva court, court faded at three years. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to celebrate the life of our dear friend Kevin. Um, if I may paraphrase two of his chums, this would probably be satirised by him amazingly straight after. So um, <laughs> feel free wherever you are. Kevin to satirise this in the Elysian fields. Um, I think we most of us knew Kevin pretty well here, but for newcomers to Galway who don't know the, the genius that we're talking about, to tell you, Kevin was born in London in 1967 and with his beloved life partner and wife, Susan Miller de Mar, he was the founder and the organiser of Over the Edge, which uh, marked its 20th anniversary in 2000. And 23, just uh, a few a uh, few weeks ago, really, and um, last week I think was Kevin would have been Kevin's birthday as well. So um, a lot of anniversaries. So the poetry collections that he wrote, he's, um, he's known for lots of different things, but his poetry collections, if you want to look out for them, six full collections with salmon and a new one selected as well. The poetry collections were the boy with no face in 2005. Time, Gentlemen, Please, in 2008. Frightening New Furniture in 2010. The Ghost in the Lobby in 2014. Sex and Death at Merlin Park Hospital in 2019. And in case I forget to, to say it later on, Molly Toomey, who's here on the, on the panel, Molly did one of the best book launches for that I have ever seen or heard in my life. Sex and Death in Merlin Park Hospital, and then Ecstatic in in 2022 and the new and selected came out in 2017 um, he was widely broadcast RT Lyric FM Radio 4 and on the internet on um, not the Andrew Marr show um, he unfortunately left the stage he left us on the 10th of January 2023 this year at the age of 55 um, and we're celebrating him here today as a poet a teacher an organizer and a satirist, and this is an international tribute to one of Galway's own, and another one of Galway's own, on Tuchtron, Michael D. Higgins, President of Ireland, said of him, he could not think of anyone who did more to bring the public to the appreciation and the joy of poetry, to mark the case for performed poetry, and to encourage others to read poetry and to make poems and to bring that meaning into their lives. So today we mark and celebrate with a wonderful number of artists and um, some visitors on video. And the first person who's going to speak about Kevin is uh, Molly Toomey, whom I mentioned. He introduced her to poetry in NUI Galway in 2015. Um, she'd come up from 
uh, Waterford and Cork. It was during her undergraduate degree. He went on to express unflinching belief at every stage in her emerging career, inviting her to fe feature at Over the Edge when she still had no publication to her name and, as I said, to launch her publication, uh, into, to launch his collection, Sex and Death in Merlin Park in 2019. Molly would later do an MA in creative writing in UCC and publish her debut collection, Raised Among Vultures, with the Gallery Press last year. So, Angela, Molly. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it, is, it is an absolute honour to be here um, because Kevin has played such a pivotal role in my career as a poet. Um, so I did, I met Kevin in 2015 in NUI Galway when I was taking an arts with creative writing degree and it was my first ever poetry class and I was really uneasy, didn't know what to expect. And actually what happened is that Kevin gave me permission to write about myself, uh, to write about what was going on for me and to write in my own voice, which I haven't really been doing. Um, and that was, that was really important to me because at the time I was really struggling and I, I had an undiagnosed eating disorder um, and I was really lost, I didn't have any friends. Uh, and the voice that, ar that arose was, was one of anger actually because I was suffering so much um, and I began to direct my anger towards uh, a culture that was promoting eating disorders and uh, commodifying uh, people in order to, um, I don't know, just promote really unhealthy behaviours. Uh, and I wrote a poem in Kevin's class called Eat Yourself Beautiful. Um, and it was my first published poem. It was published in the Irish Times. Um, because, as you know, Kevin would give you a kind of confidence where you think, you know, you could be in the Irish Times. Um, so I, I sent it off. And then maybe a year or so later, Kevin sent me his own poem uh, called Eat Yourself. And when I look at the poem now, I am reminded of how Kevin always stood up for the vulnerable, um, you know, and always he was willing to kind of put himself, you know, on the firing line if it meant, you know, protecting those people who were struggling and who were voiceless. Um, and this is called Eat Yourself after Rosanna Davidson. Accessorise, and this is Kevin's poem, just so you know, it's not my poem. <laughs> Mine was a little less harsh, but I still think this is brilliant. Um, eat yourself. Accessorise yourself with genetically modified eyebrows. Batter yourself in cement mix. Crap yourself beautiful. Dye yourself bright yellow. Eat yourself with a special set of false teeth you ordered from the Kama Sutra. Garnish yourself with knotweed. Lick yourself leathery. Moon yourself in the shop window. Numb yourself in a bathtub filled with dettol. Undo yourself with vodka martinis. Order yourself a copy of yourself from the catalogue. Fillet yourself twice weekly on the chopping board mother gave you. Heal yourself with hydrochloric acid. Inter yourself under the new driveway. Jail yourself in a greenhouse full of false widow spiders grown bitter. Kill yourself by drowning unintentionally in liquidised beetroot. Peel yourself regularly with an onion slicer that takes its issues out on people like you. Question yourself harshly with the rustiest bread knife you can find. Roll yourself in the worst lemon meringue money ever changed hands for. Starve yourself, stupid. Tie yourself to a tree with your grandfather's vast collection of leather belts. Vaporise yourself with an imp improvised atom bomb. Wrap yourself in the compost heap. Exonerate yourself, never. Yap yourself, skinny. Zip yourself the fuck up. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I love this. I really do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly Toomey.
And now I'm, to, I'm invited up to the lectern, Jesse Lendeni. Jesse is the founder and the publisher of Salmon. Hi, hi everybody. Um, you said, you know, I hope I can get through this without crying, but um, I will, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it's when uh, Kevin and I, I think it was around November, December, were talking about having an event uh, during which, you know, just a kind of big event with him. <laughs> and um, and I said, oh, don't know, that, that Kevin don't want to make it sound like a, a memorial. And uh, so the person missing here today is, is Kevin. Uh, but uh, if you don't need me to tell you that, that's... So, so a funny story, okay, a funny story, because we'd been, oh, going back, I suppose it's going on 30 years, you know, certainly 25 years, and nine books, and another one to come out uh, next year, and one from Susan as well. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so um, Kevin and I wound up, Kevin and Susan and I wound up in places like, you know, you know, the, 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 uh, on the tube in London and, and, uh, and Los Angeles and all these places that in Denver, um, <laughs> places, yeah. And it was so, you know, he was a unique companion and he, you know, a unique voice. And it's an absolute honor to have published him, published the nine books as it happens, which is including Over the Edge, the anthology. And uh, so I um, heard, I had a message from someone saying, well, um, it's awful, Kevin died. And I, you know, <laughs> you stop. <laughs> and um, so that was that day. <clears throat> and the next day I woke up in this poem. So that's, I'm just going to read this. Uh, and that's it. Um, oh no, I have to tell the story. Sorry, Susan. I have to tell the story. This is funny. Okay, I hope. Anyway, so there we were. I was in, in, following on from being all these different places. We were coming back. This is this is before the motorway. So I was driving back from Dublin, and as one did, one stopped in Moat, and uh, in the Supermax. So me and Kevin and Susan we go in, and you know this, you know. Get the dinner of my treat, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we come out. And Kevin said, uh, "Oh, is this one of those publishers' dinners that I heard so much about?" <laughs> oh God! Oh God's rolling about laughing. Oh God! Honestly, yeah, that's the Irish way. To <laughs> no, <laughs> Supermax. Oh, uh, but uh, you know, deserve a lot more than that, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> this is called Candles. <clears throat> um, sadness in the shadows as I walk up the stairs to my office. My heart wants to cry, but crying has its own time. And now it says, Loss? What do you know about loss? And why are you sitting here now, expecting something, someone to say, Ah, oh, yeah, it was all a joke. Have you lost all your humor too? Turn on all the lights. Light the candles. You can cry when the last poem has been forgotten. It's... Thank you, Jesse. I've known Jesse for, I think, 42 years, and it doesn't seem a minute too long. And to another great veteran now with whom uh, Kevin had phenomenal relations um, in the best artistic sense. And we're going to VCR now to Ken Loach, um, director of Kez and uh, The Wind That Shakes the Barley and so many fantastic and important movies. So we're going to hear now from Ken Loach. There's one good case that hasn't been mentioned and some here may know about it, and I just thought I'd pass on as a little story. Kevin Higgins? Yeah. The story of Kevin the Higgins? The Kevin Higgins, yes, the poet and writer. Yeah. 
He was suspended in June 2016. Now, he lives in Ireland. He's a, um, an overseas member. And he was suspended because he satirised Tony Blair in a poem. <laughs> so, look, I, I, brought, I brought it along. I thought you might like to hear it. <laughs> I, I, won't read the, I won't read the whole poem because it's quite long. And it's, um, it's a rewriting of Brecht's poem of the... the, the the, the soldier's wife. What did the soldier's wife receive? Obviously, the soldier is shot, and the soldier's wife just gets, you know, something entirely <coughs> insignificant. Um, and uh, this is just a little bit from Kevin Higgins. Th th this, you, you've got to leave. The, we're probably all complicit. We all have to be suspended from the Labour yes. Party. If you hear this, so we'll if you don't want to be suspended, you better leave the room now. Yeah, anyway, here, yeah. here it goes. It, this is where it finishes up. And what did she get, the ex-Prime Minister's no longer new wife, from all the depleted uranium shells he had dropped during the Battle of Basra? All the soldiers he sent to meet improvised explosive devices in far Mesopotamia. For these she got white knight terrors of him on trial for all their crimes, and the desire to never again look out the front window of their fine Connaught Square house at the tree from which it said they used to once string traitors. <laughs> For that, he's kicked out of the party. Well, I guess he's not the only one to be disgusted by Blair, by his illegality, by the hundreds of thousands of people he caused to die and for the millions he's made since he left office. Yes. If yes. anyone brings the part into disrepute, it's that man. Great. So keeping with art and politics, our next speaker is Kern Andrews. Kern is Marketing and Communications Manager of Galway Art Centre. And before that, for 20 glittering years, he was political editor and arts editor of the Galway Advertiser, where he did a phenomenal amount of work in promoting, encouraging, and supporting the arts in Galway. He and Kevin uh, became very close friends. Uh, Kern invited Kevin to become poetry reviewer for the Advertiser. And a friendship developed. They called their uh, regular meetings tea summits because they used to meet in the little Java tea and coffee shop and then in Mocha Beans, neither of whom, as far as I know, are actually getting any um, kickbacks for getting mentioned today. <laughs> um, but alas, the tea summits are over. But Kernan is still with us to talk about Kevin. Kernan Andrews. <laughs> Thank you, James. Kevin Higgins was a great friend of mine, and we used to meet regularly in Javas. And hello, young man, would always be the greeting that is given. <laughs> and I say it not to imitate him, because I won't hear it again. So. We both loved Paul Brady's song, The Island. And like that, I'm not here to sing no sad song. So I'd like to talk about Kevin writing the insider page for the Galway Advertiser. He was one of our regular contributors. And our managing director for that page would ask, make sure it ruffles feathers. <laughs> With Kevin, the feathers weren't ruffled. They were plucked. <laughs> and the remaining carcass thrown onto the barbecue <laughs> while Kevin watched in delight as the irate phone calls would come into the Advertiser to say how mortally offended members of Fine Gale were when Kevin Higgins dared to suggest that uh, a bishop and a vibrator were not a good match <laughs> when he was writing about Fine Gale's housing policy. The criticism of Fine Gale's housing policy was not what bothered the members of Fine Gale in Galway. No, it was that elderly members were offended by the sexual imagery that Kevin employed. There's a lesson in there, in, a, 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 in there somewhere about what political priorities were for the centre-right in Ireland, which was not lost on Kevin. But it's because of that that whenever I would tell my former editor, Declan Varley, Kevin is writing the insider this week, Kevin, Declan's response is always, oh God, what's the body count going to be? <laughs> and when I told Kevin that, his response was, oh, oh, joy, joy, oh, 
<laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he took great pride in that image of himself as a, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the machine gun still smoking, a corpse of centre-right individuals <laughs> lying before his feet. And one of his proudest achievements was when Owen Harris felt himself slighted and wrote, uh, wrote in threatening all legal action against us because Kevin had written an article saying, isn't it terrible that in this day and age, Ireland is not allowed to call itself Ireland anymore. It has to be the island, all island. The island that doesn't dare not, uh, that dare not call itself by its own name anymore. And uh, eventually the article had to be taken down from the Galway Advertiser website. But Kevin, as the king of social media in Galway, made absolutely sure that it was shared everywhere <laughs> he, could, he could possibly share it. Every Sinn Féin member in, across Ireland, every nor Northern Republican and everybody who did not like Owen Harris had read that article by the time it came down. And Kevin said to me, Everybody who saw it needed to, everybody who needed to see it saw it. <laughs> and so I'd like to say thank you so much to Kevin Higgins for all those challenging articles he wrote. And in particular, I wasn't doing so well last year with various mental health issues. Um, but when we'd meet Kevin for the tea summits, despite the fact of his own difficulties, he made sure every time to ask me how I was, ask me in detail, get me to talk in detail about it, and support me through every single bit of that. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Karen. Now we're going to the screen again to Alva, Dar Alva Darcy. Alva is a poet and academic based in the UK, where she's a senior lecturer in Cardiff. Her most recent collection of poetry, Insistence, was published in 2018 by Blood X Books, and it won the Wales Book of the Year and the Piggott Prize for Poetry. And we're now going to hear a special message that she's recorded about Kevin. When I was supposed to be studying for my Leaving Cert History exam, I wrote a poem about history instead and sent it off to Kevin Higgins, who was then the editor of Burning Bush magazine. And greatly to my astonishment, he published it. That was the first poem that I had ever had published, so of course it, it meant a great deal to me. But even more astonishingly, he remembered the poem um, and brought it up um, in conversation with me some 20 years later. Um, and I think that that's a measure of the extraordinary, the extraordinary generosity and support um, that Kevin had for younger poets. He was there for us wholeheartedly and with curiosity that was the best kind of love. So I could not be more honoured um, to, to, to be asked to read a poem of Kevin's today. I feel entirely unworthy to do so. Kevin um, saw something in my work which I didn't see myself. And I think that's something that he did for lots of younger poets. And when I write, he's one of a handful of people that I'm trying not to let down. A few years after that um, Leaving Cert History exam, when I was a student, I organised a poetry reading at the Winding Stair Bookshop in Dublin, along with a friend of mine, Clodagh Moynan. And we were big admirers of Kevin's poetry that we'd never met him yet um, or heard him read. And we thought that the people of Dublin um, deserved a chance to do so. So we did it on a shoestring, we couldn't get any funding. So I think I paid for, the, for Kevin's train fare myself and Clodagh's mum donated some wine and we baked some Rice Krispie cakes for the audience. Um, I don't remember all the details, but I will never forget Kevin's reading that night. It was a really hot night, it was July. So the, the door of the bookshop was held open and the mic was quite loud and Kevin's voice, of course, was super powerful. So people walking down the street could hear him reading and could hear the audience um, laughing their heads off. And um, so people passing by couldn't help but be curious what was going on and started coming inside. And more and more passers-by kept coming in, more and more people squishing into this tiny space um, of the winding stair bookshop until you couldn't have squeezed another person in. And now people start stopping in the street and they're kind of gathering outside the shop and craning to hear. And I've never been at a poetry reading before or since. 
that um, was so kind of crammed with people, with people sort of um, jostling to get an ear in. Kevin had this voice that could pull people in off the street, and of course his poems made them want to stay around. Um, and that poetry, which of course he's left with us for keeps, is profoundly democratic. It speaks to anyone and for anyone, regardless of their background or experience of poetry. And um, so his legacy is one that will endure. There's so much to be said um, about the combination of generosity and of course wickedness and um, the distinguished Kevin and his work. But I'll go ahead and read you one of his wicked poems instead, as I've been asked to do. So this is sensual, Sensualist Resolutions. Drink whiskey not because you think it'll fix your personality, but because the first sip always tastes like the best glass of smoke available this side of hell, and makes your throat dream of tomorrow morning's pint glass of water helping down the greasiest bacon sandwich in the history of Greece. <laughs> Treat yourself to the occasional cigar, not because anyone's granny said there's nothing like it to clear out the lungs, but because in a certain light, namely the dark, it makes you look like Che Guevara if he'd lived to lose 90% of his hair. <laughs> Embrace the bitterness of black tea without a single grain of sugar. Drink disgustingly strong coffee. Let it tarnish all your teeth. And never sniff a bedsheet or a pair of knickers for anything other than the sheer aesthetic relevant. <laughs> and now uh, we will say goodbye to Curden, to Molly and to Jessie. Um, that's, it's only temporary goodbye. I'm only going to the audience. <laughs> And I, I think uh, Danny Gill deserves a round of applause for putting this fantastic programme together. So, and indeed, Susan Miller Damar as well for, for being there. So now we're going to have um, a new panel, which is very exciting. So, um, joining us first is um, Alan O'Brien. Alan's here, yeah? Yeah. Um, Alan is a working class writer from Finglas Valley Mun, Dublin area, who's been published in numerous publications. He's been shortlisted for the Mae Binchy Award for travel writing in 2015 with his short story, Kuba C, and was winner of the PJ O'Connor Award for radio drama in 2016 with his play Snow Falls and So Do We. And indeed, there's a story there. Just recently, Alan, in collaboration with a group of other writers, had the radio play Dealing with the Housing Crisis, entitled Alarm Bells, shortlisted for the Writers Guild of Ireland Zebby Awards in 2022. And indeed, that story I mentioned, Alan was contacted by Kevin with regards to his poem Critique, a poem Kevin wrote after hearing the deafening silence on the, on the mistreatment administered to Alan by RTE, subsequent to him winning the PJ O'Connor Award. So, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an absolute honour to be here today. I never did get to meet Kevin Higgins personally, that we were in contact and had arranged to, to meet up eventually. Uh, as I said, I'm a bricklayer by trade, and in 20, 2008, after the after the, the bailout and my industry was gone, I returned to education, uh, getting a degree in English and history, and a certificate in oral history. But I provided myself with the tools to allow myself to write and give myself permission to write. So I started started writing, and it. When I started UCD in 2010, a thing happened in Ballymun, where I'm from, where I, where I developed uh, a young girl named Rachel Peavoy froze to death or flat in uh, Jordan Big Snow in January 2010. Uh, and the reason was because 
the council had turned the heating off to the flats. Uh, in Ballymun, you didn't control your own heating. The heating was controlled centrally. So anyone who lived there knew that they turned the heating off. But when I went to the coroner's report, they said it was death by misadventure. And that incensed me. Uh, so much that I, I ended up writing a short story. First of all, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and I couldn't do anything else but write this. And as I was writing it, I was thinking about how long there could be sound effects put in here and here and here and here. So I did that. And I sent it into the PJ O'Connor Award for Radio Drama. Also in 2016, I had another play on in Liberty Hall called From the Backbone Out, a stage play uh, about, the, uh, about the, the general secretary of my trade union, uh, the Ancient Guild of Incorporates Brick and Stone Layers, who was, who was shot by the man who shot Francis Sheehy Skeffenden. Uh, Rich, uh, my general secretary's name is Richard O'Connor. Anyway, I'm getting off there. So during that time, I got shortlisted and I, I was so involved in this other play that I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention. And the next thing, I started getting text messages one day saying, congratulations, I was going, for, for what? And it turned out I won. And it was brilliant to win and I, I was totally overwhelmed. And when I went in to the, when I went into the, into RTE, I was given this producer who kept pushing me on why 2010, why was it 2010, why 2010? And I told him, you know, because that's when I started, you really start getting a grip, and that's the, but the flats were coming down, but why 2010, Alan? Because that's the year Rachel Peavoy froze to death in our flat and valley one. Oh, he says, that's this, is it? Well, you want politics, you can go to Sean O'Rourke. Now, I, got, I began a debate with him about it would be easier to pick out what Irish literature wasn't political than the one that was political. But either way, they, they made the play, but they turned into a dream sequence. They took out some key lines, they changed it, and in the end, she didn't die. And they said, That's not my play. And they said, Well, after this, you can do the fuck you like with this play, Alan. I said, Is that right? I went home and I emailed everyone saying I was refusing my permission to my intellectual property unless you fix the play. Now his his issue was this this is this is Joanne's story, not Rachel. Right, which is true because the only similarity between my character Joanne Bowland and Rachel Peavoy was the nature and untimely deaths. So either way, anyway, the head of the hunt I had to I had to refuse permission. And basically, they gave me me five thousand and told me to fuck off in a nice way. That was grand. I went and made it myself the whole lot. And I, you know, contacted people about it. I got really strange reaction, especially from some of my writing peers. Like one fella, another working class writer, found me up, and he said, uh, "Alan, just let them do what they're doing. You know what I mean? Uh, you're cutting your nose off to spite your face." And I was like, "Call him." Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said his name. <laughs> I was like, look, if I, if I, start, if I start relenting now, I'm, I'm never going to, you know what I mean? You can't do that anyway. That was the last time we spoke to that chap. So anyway, that was, that was fine. And then, you know, I kind of felt the, I kind of felt the, the whole thing that like Beckett and stuff were felt a bit where I felt totally like there was not nothing. And, and, and no one was listening and, and except for the likes of Jenny Farrell and stuff. The next thing I got this, this message from Kevin. And I was familiar with Kevin's work. Uh, I would say about Kevin's poetry that he was like a breath of fresh air in a fog of farts. Really? <laughs> I, really, his, 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 I really did class his poetry. And when, he, when, I, when I read this, he said, I've, Jenny Farrell was telling me about your experience with RTE. And I wrote, I wrote a poem uh, loosely based on it. Would you have any objections to be dedicating it to you? Well, that was like that was like a boost that I can't, I can't tell you that I really needed, and and I, 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 I wanted to tell the man this myself personally, looking in his eyes and by my point and say thank you, because he gave me a sport that that, that I, I really did need. And when I when I say when I say in his sickness and, the, and, and his own, his death, it was yeah, it's a huge and terrible loss. Anyway. So I'll, I'll, read, I'll, read this, I'll read this poem and I'll do it as closely to the accent of the producer that I, uh, 
experienced as possible. It's called critique for. I hope you won't take this personally. But think your script about a woman starving to death in a high rise flat, which, let's face it, she was lucky to have in the first place, of limited appeal to what we'll broadly call people like me. The scene in which she notices her ribs through her skin, just after electricity is cut off, and she's unable to call anyone because her phone is out of credit, I found oddly lacking in optimism. <laughs> One realises such things happen at the margins and probably more often than is, strictly speaking, economically necessary. But one must make it relatable for people who've gone through the Flaubertian trauma of getting divorced three times in Dorky. Or, worse, not getting divorced at all in the better portions of my column. <laughs> The people I represent demand nuance, in which your script with its protruding ribs, electricity cut off and dead mobile is weirdly lacking. The occasional joke wouldn't go amiss either, particularly at your main character's expense. It would make her more empathy inducing for the woman queuing in the specialist cheese shop, a key part of our audience. And a romantic interest Perhaps the guy who was her social worker for the cutbacks, she keeps mentioning him, would be a humanising addition. Otherwise, she is reduced to being a woman who dies of failing to complete the forms required to access the relevant supports, which I'm sure there must be out there, somewhere, from some government agency or other, or one of those philanthropic trusts who assist such people. I'm surmising here, but find I generally know what I am talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Alan. Uh, brilliant to have you here at court. Now, Dr. Philip Coleman is a professor of English at Trinity in Dublin, and he wrote the afterword to. Kevin's 2017 collection, New and Selected Poems, uh, which had the main title, Some Songs 2.0. So, Philip. The Book of War is busy scribbling another chapter of itself hardly a syllable of which is true. You are in it, given your own continued existence at this point in the story. Just over a year ago, on the 7th of March 2022, Kevin Higgins wrote these lines in a poem called The Book of War, which was published online uh, in broadsheet.ie. Like many of his poems, The Book of War reminds us that we are all involved, directly or indirectly, in creating the conditions of our world. When the invasion of Ukraine began, Kevin wrote, one vowed to abstain from Shostakovich, another refused from now on to teach Dostoevsky. Not to be outdone, a third clocked that this morning it tried to send a parcel of AK-47s by registered post. Others wanted to shoot down planes, because that's how peace is made. In the Lake Isle of Innisfree, William Butler Yeats imagined being able to find peace in a place far away from the cares of the world, far from the pavement's grey of the city and far too from any real island in the west of Ireland or any place else. Yeats's Innisfree was a free space of imagination, a space where poetry could happen unencumbered by the demands of modern life in the self-sufficing simplicity of living in what he called a small cabin all alone in a bee loud glade. Even in his most political poems, Yeats 
yearned to escape from the cares of the world, as he put it in his poem, Politics. And maybe what they say is true of war and war's alarms, but oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. Kevin Higgins, however, could never ignore the noise of the world around him. Even in his last poem, I always thought I'd live. He lamented the fact that he wouldn't live to see trickle-down economics deliver at least one, albeit slightly polluted, drop, or run the risk of getting tossed in the back of a police van by over-enthusiastic members of the constabulary. This was, he wrote, a luxury his lungs could no longer afford. Even holding a placard in his wheelchair would soon have him gasping for breath. In the title piece of his prose collection, Poetry, Politics and Dorothy Gone Horribly Astray, written in 2004, Kevin wrote that the best thing writers can do is bear witness as honestly and as well as they possibly can not just to the hypocrisy of particular individuals, but also to the broader international crises of our time. These include conflicts in various parts of the world, but also what he described as the degeneration of the high socialist hopes of the early 20th century into sordid everyday tyranny. He wrote these words in an essay on the Albanian poet Vizar Giti. In this essay, he disagreed with those who have criticized the works of certain poets because of their perceived detachment from the world of politics and economic materiality. Unlike those who would act Stalin when dealing with, with poetry, which doesn't appear to serve the cause, as he puts it, Kevin sought to, sought to credit the value of poetry for its ability to raise consciousness and conscience in the public sphere. For him, poetry is always a public event and throughout his work, he steadily insisted on the place of the poet in the life of the state. And this is reflected in Kevin's work in uh, performance, especially, I think. But it also has to do with his sense of the social and public potency of the word on the page as it merges with the reader's consciousness. Kevin's death was and is a terrible loss to everyone who knew and loved him. And I just want to take uh, this opportunity today to publicly express my condolences to Susan, as well as to Kevin's father, Stephen, his sister, Susan, and, and, and the extended uh, Higgins family. Kevin is gone, but his words remain. Launching his book, Ecstatic, in June of, the, of last year, Alva Darcy said that the personal and the political are intertwined in the most profound of senses in Kevin's work. And I completely agree with this claim. Kevin Higgins's work will survive because of its searing honesty, but more importantly, because of its insistence that poetry matters in all areas of our lives, the public and the personal. In a poem called The Epilogue, of which time makes a preface, the Albanian poet Kevin greatly admired, Vizarjiti wrote, and still, I write poems, though no one reads them. Perhaps the wind does not, need, does not read the stars at night. Maybe the cliffs at the seaside feel nothing of the fury of the waves. Kevin Higgins believed that his words, his poems, would outlive him, as they were always destined to do. I hope he knew that. His readers mourned the fact that he did not live to write more poems, but we all also acknowledge the lasting power of his art and his commitment to the life of the word on and off the page. When peace comes, he wrote in his poem War and Peace, we'll slowly forget the name of war. There'll be so much peace, we'll be busy not knowing what to do with it. When, somewhere, we've probably never heard of, one guy takes something the other says is his, and while we're dozing on the sofa or forgetting to brush our teeth, 
They'll start bringing Metternich, Clemenceau, Henry Kissinger and the intercontinental ballistic missile back from the dead to teach us again the meaning of certain words. But the poet will always be there first, reminding us that words are the most powerful weapons of all. And this is especially the case in the work of Kevin Higgins, a poet who spoke truth to power in every word he wrote. When she launched Ecstasy last year, Alva Darcy quoted the American poet Muriel Rukeyser in relation to Kevin's work. In The Life of Poetry, Rukeyser argued that there is one kind of knowledge, infinitely precious, time-resistant more than monuments, here to be passed between the generations in any way it may be, never to be used, and that is poetry. This applies too to the poetry of Kevin Higgins. It is and will remain here to be passed between the generations in any way it may be, in books, in readings, in recordings and in events like this. So thank you, Susan, for giving us this opportunity today to express our admiration for Kevin's work and our belief that his work will persist for as long as these things matter. Um, thank you, Philip, for that stunning address. And now, a multimedia experience with Kristen Lintoff. Um, Kristen uh, used to host variety nights and comedy nights for um, Jeremy Corbyn and Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. Um, since that uh, vanished from the stage and Jeremy Corbyn's um, world has become homeless and his fans have become homeless politically, um, Crispin has hosted Zoom events to keep the spirits up, including, which was mentioned earlier before, the um, Not The Andrew Marr Show. So we're going to have Crispin here with us and also on the screen. First of all, it's a great pleasure to welcome to the lectern Crispin Flintoff. Um, thank you. Thank you for... Um, uh, inviting me, Susan, to speak. I wasn't um, expecting to speak. I just wanted to come and visit, really. Um, I don't feel like a very important person, um, and I haven't prepared a speech, so this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> uh, but um, And I never met Kevin. I never met him in the flesh once, and uh, I feel quite sad that I never met him, because... Uh, I spoke to him many times on Zoom. Um, he was there to perform a poem, but we'd speak for an hour and he'd set me OK about the way politics was going in the UK and in the world. Um, and uh, I miss him uh, greatly because he was imaginative about how we can talk about politics, how we can engage people with politics. And he was funny and he was mischievous and he was rude and um, he was shocking and uh, I, love, I love that, I love, I love that and, uh, um, and so many people who watch Not The Andrew Marr Show um, have sent messages to say they wish Kevin um, the best uh, and Susan the best and everyone in his family the best and, um, and one of the, the, the saddest things is that um, it, I invited Kevin to come to London just uh, at the end of uh, 2021 for an awards ceremony where um, I was uh, going to give him uh, the, the award for Poet of the Year because he had just been expelled from the Labour Party for <laughs> another poem uh, that he wrote, not the Tony Blair one. He just wrote a poem that was in the wrong publication um, and they, they expelled him for it. So I was going to um, give him this award, but he couldn't make it because of the COVID uh, situation. It got worse at that point, just before Christmas. Uh, and then I tried to send it in the post to him, um, and it was sent back to me, returned to sender, and I thought I'd, I'd meet up with him and give it to him, but I never did. So I brought it along. Um, here it is, uh, post of the year uh, for Kevin, and I'm going to give it to Susan uh, after this. Um, and I really, I, I just wanted to say uh, it's, it's an honour to be here 
and uh, I'll, I'll keep playing Kevin's poems every show, uh, and he'll he'll never be forgotten. Uh, that's all I'll say really. This poem is that uh, I wrote uh, last month, and it is uh, it looks forward to the catastrophically uh, to the coming winter, um, and uh, to just two references to maybe explain. Kalai is a very posh uh, suburb of County uh, uh, Dublin. And the Galway advertiser is our local newspaper. You could substitute uh, any local newspaper uh, for this. How to survive next winter. Turn off the heat. Instead, warm yourself by setting fire to your free weekly copy of the Galway advertiser. <laughs> Be sure and arm yourself with extra by liberating them from your neighbor's letterbox. <laughs> Sit alone. Uh, sorry, I need to do it again, actually. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. This poem looks catastrophically uh, forward towards uh, the coming winter, from the point of view of the fuel crisis, uh, and one or two other things. And two references to uh, explain. Kalini is a very posh. Um, suburb of, of Dublin. Bono lives near there. <laughs> All the advertisements are in the newspaper, which you can substitute uh, any uh, local newspaper uh, in the UK. How to survive next winter. Turn off the heat. Instead, warm yourself by setting fire to your free weekly copy of the Galway Advertiser. Be sure and arm yourself with extra by liberating them from your neighbor's letterboxes. Sit in the dark, preferably alone, so you don't spread the pox to anyone else, wearing a cheap pair of unsustainable sunglasses. They're the only luxury we'll allow you. Get extra underwear second-hand from your local merchant. I hear they plan to start selling them out of the back of the hearses for which they can no longer afford petrol. There are bargains to be got. Exercise personal responsibility. Begin eating spiders, dandelion, and for calcium, each other's toenails. But only as a weekend treat. The notion of eating each day is a pre-war social construct. Spend the October bank holiday rolled up in an old carpet, and Christmas writing limericks. There was a young man from Kalini whose plans for world domination were stymied. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you there, Kevin. Wow. Um, that was um, Alan and Philip and um, gosh, got the name already. Crispin. Crispin. So thank you very much for coming over. And we'll, um, and, and not, not, the, not the Andrew Marr show. So we're now is the um, something definitely to catch up with. So now we're going to have three more on the panel. Our final three, Jenny Farrell, Frank Norton, and Des Kilban. Um, Dr. Jenny Farrell is an adjunct a lecturer at ATU here in Galway, where she taught Irish literature from 1986 to 2021. She's been actively involved in the Leem and Tom O'Flaherty Society since its foundation in 2013. She's published widely and is an associate editor of Culture Matters, in which role she edited three anthologies of working people's writing from contemporary Ireland and was given this task 
she met Kevin Higgins, who took an active interest in the project and contributed to it himself. So, Dr. Jenny Farrell. Yes, as um, James has pointed out, I got to know Kevin through the common interest in promoting working class writing. You heard Alan O'Brien earlier on. Alan um, was involved um, in contributing to these anthologies. They were the first anthologies ever um, of contemporary working class writing in Ireland. And we produced um, one in 2019. That was poetry. Um, there, I have a few copies with me that, if anybody's interested, they'll be at the door when we finish. Um, it was followed in 2020 by a prose anthology and finally a year later by an anthology of writing for children. Kevin was involved from the start and enthusiastically supported the project by contributing himself, but also by using his extensive network uh, to make the call out as widely known as possible that we were able to win almost 70 poets um, and later almost 50 prose writers from, uh, for the project from the whole island of Ireland and further afield was greatly thanks to Kevin. Kevin understood absolutely the power of literature and the struggles of the day. We have seen many examples today of this. Um, he grasped fully how working class writers are marginalized and how their subject matter was unwelcome to the cultural establishment. Um, Alan just explained that very, very well uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, lately, and, and this is another theme that has been um, uh, obvious to us all this morning, uh, he took a very definite stand against war and warmongering and satirically highlighted such propaganda wherever he could. He wrote in defense of uh, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace when they were attacked uh, by the Irish Times for being Putin's puppets and Chinese spies. And now I uh, quote and I'll read his poem. Um, he has a little introduction, a poem inspired by the great work of Neve O'Reilly of the Dorky uh, Episcopalian has done of late to whip up support for World War III. It was great to see said newspaper following in its own tradition by whipping up support for World War just as it did in 1914. And here comes the poem. She had, she thought, a thousand things to say. Of the Trinity School of Journalese, she was a product. And when they were told to, people bought her, put her on their marble finished kitchen counters and dreamed of World War Three and Four and liked her monotone clack so much, they plopped another two euro coin in the relevant slot so they could hear once more everyone she disagreed with or whose fabulous hair she was jealous of be called Chinese spies. And all the other little journalisers rushed in to squeak their weasel agreement uh, apart from the predictable elements who were naturally just more Chinese spies. As people like, uh, like her tend to, she got what she wanted. Lots of people saying her name, though not all of them pronounced it right, and some of them were barely people. And eventually, both world wars, three and four. And there were no more marble kitchen tops, no more two euro coins, nor slops to plop them in, and from her, no more squeaks. Best of all, there were no more four-wheel drives or children to drive to sporting events in them. We all died happily ever after, apart from those Chinese spies and their acolytes who died most unhappily. But there's no pleasing some people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenny Farrell, and now Frank Nocton. Uh, Garamati, uh, James, uh, I guess, uh, G. A poem by the late Kevin Higgins. I always thought I'd live. His final poem. I always thought I'd live to learn how to swim, do the backward butterfly to Olympic standard, and see trickle-down economics deliver at least one, albeit slightly polluted, drop. 
I always thought I'd live to learn how to drive, win at least one Grand Prix motor racing championship and see the Democrats legislate for free universal health care. I always thought I'd live to tidy the books off the study floor and see fascists give up stabbing black boys at stops because peaceful protests have eloquently made them see the error of their ways. But the books that made me still decorate the study floor and I don't have the oxygen to shift them. My consultants are unanimous. My days marching to places like Welling and Trafalgar Square are over. The risk of getting tossed into the back of a police van by over-enthusiastic members of the constabulary is a luxury my lungs can no longer afford. Even holding a placard in my wheelchair would soon have me gasping for breath. And I always thought I'd live. I've known Kevin for about 34 years. Um, I was married to his sister, Helen, and I think she may be here today. I'm not 100% sure. I think she traveled over from London. And um, we have a lovely son. His name is Mark. He's a doctor in London now. And when Kevin was ill, Mark was over quite a good bit. And, um, and so was uh, Helen. And I'm sure Kevin questioned Mark intently about all the different vagaries that could happen with his illness. Um, one of the reasons I am here is uh, Kevin and I always stayed in touch uh, because, you know, when you're promoting concerts and various different things, you need the thumbs up on Facebook, the share, the Instagram. And uh, we were of the Mutual Appreciation Society. He would share me and I would share him, especially all the stuff that Susan and himself did with the writing groups over the years. And uh, there was barely a week went by where Kernan didn't have one of us in the paper. And uh, we always made reference to that. And it was always a very mutual thing and a very kind thing. Uh, I remember Kevin when I was very young, as I say, as a very charming, a very witty person, softly spoken, but very strong as well. Always a little bit chesty. Um, he always struggled with that part of his life, um, but was a copious tea drinker. Um, his poor mother, Mary, whom Kevin helped to uh, care for in her later days, uh, about 10 years ago, I'm sure she went through many kettles in Carberry Road and many tea bags throwing the eyes up to heaven that were left in the sink and not put in the bin, which would totally drive me crazy as well with my OCD. Um, I always felt I would have loved to have seen Kevin on something like Question Time or Prime Time, taking on Nigel Farage or Bertie Hearn and <laughs> sticking them with a subtle point of logic. But uh, he didn't get there, but he got into our hearts and into our minds. Um, but the main reason I think that I am here today, I did sing at Kevin's funeral and I was absolutely privileged to do that. Susan was good enough to ask me and uh, I was absolutely delighted to do that for Kevin, you know. But Kevin suffered from myeloid leukemia and um, I myself suffer from a disease called multiple myeloma. I've had it since I was 27 years of age, which is 24 years now. And it's in the leukemia family. Uh, when I was diagnosed with it, just to give some context of what I'm going to say, when I was diagnosed with the disease initially, I was 27. And it was the youngest recorded uh, suffering of that disease in anywhere in Europe at the time. It was a disease that was inherent in people in their 70s and 80s. Um, but with that, I had to get on with it, and uh, after copious amounts of chemotherapy, the disease was not doing very well, and I was in line for a major uh, bone marrow transplant, a very complicated one, and it was to be done in Paris. And uh, at that time, I had a broken back. I couldn't walk. I was just completely incapacitated and very sick from the disease that had ravaged my body entirely. And... Um, it was decided that I wouldn't really survive 
the trip over to Paris, never mind the operation that had to have to be done. My brothers, my twin brothers, were compatible for me and they were willing uh, to give me their bone marrow. But in the end, it was decided that was too dangerous. Um, so there was one more route for me and it was called a stem cell transplant, which was completely unheard of at that time. They were doing them in America and they had started to do them in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. And um, they came to me with this and they, it was basically a Hail Mary pass for me because there was no other road for me. Um, and it was done in the University College Hospital here. It was the very first one that was done there on the day. So all the big wigs were there and everybody else. I didn't care about anything like that. I just wanted to get well as anybody does when they're facing a such uh, prognosis. Um, so they were my stem cells, just to be uh, clear about that. They're harvested from your body. They're cryogenically frozen and then you go home and you try and get as well as you can and then you're brought back in and they give you the stem cells and uh, the high dose chemotherapy to the stem cells reboot your system after that. The ultimate irony of all that is that when you, they do the harvest you have to try and get as well as you can <laughs> before you come back in to get really really sick again you know. And uh, Kevin was very interested in all that because that was a route that he was I think maybe hoping that he could have went down. Uh, when you do have the transplant, you basically put your head under the covers for a few months and you hope that you come out the other side. Um, I was very, very lucky. I did come out the other side. Um, but for Kevin, unfortunately for him, uh, with his lung problem that he had most of his life, he was never able to get well enough to be able to benefit from the uh, stem cell transplant that we all hoped that he may have had. Uh, one of the things we talked about in our conversations uh, was being in hospital with cancer and it's unlike being in hospital with a broken leg or you know something like that um, a phlebotomist which are the people that take the blood you know they're vampires we used to call them they could come to your room six or seven times a day looking for blood from you in a body that has veins that don't want to be found and you know, we all squeamish at a few needles here and there, but, you know, when somebody comes at you, maybe it could be 30 or 40 times a day, and then they start looking at your feet to see whether they get blood from there. It's a very difficult uh, situation. We talked about that. We talked about the isolation of being sick. We talked about the copious amounts of paracetamol that you have to have, the night sweats. When people call to the door with food and it turns your stomach and you have to send them away, um, the inevitable hair loss, which, as you can see, I kept going all those years later. Um, they were difficult times for him, and I always felt, and I think Susan will reiterate this, that you know, when you have somebody that has had a mutual experience to you, it can help to talk about it, to see that you know, somebody else went through that and somebody else is going through that. At Christmas... I had hoped to go and see Kevin and uh, as I say my son went to see him, his sister was there, um, Stephen his father I think got to see him as well. Uh, but I couldn't go and see him, unfortunately I was in a car accident just before Christmas and I was completely laid up after that and um, we kept in touch uh, via the phone. Uh, he rang me just after Christmas and I must say he sounded extremely buoyant and very positive I thought. I was surprised to hear him so well because, you know, Mark had been telling me the situation with him, but hope is a thing that everybody needs. It's hope is the most powerful thing in the world along with love. And if we have hope, you know, Lazarus can rise from the dead. Um, after Christmas then, uh, around the 3rd of January, Kevin rang me again. And we had another great chat about it. And he talked about the fact that they wanted to give him strong chemotherapy and so on. And he hoped that he could be well enough for that. And I just said to him, you know, just hang in there, and see what happens, you never know. Um, on the 10th of January, I was sitting down for my cup of tea in the morning after my wife went to work and uh, the children went off to school and so on. My phone rang and it was my son Mark from London and he said, uh, I'm on my way over. And he had just gone back and I was kind of thinking, right, you're on your way over again. And he said, uh, Kevin has taken a turn for the worse. And, uh, I thought, okay, he's coming over. I said, the bed is there, come on over. So about an hour and a half later, after reading, I was reading a book and 
I got another phone call, it was Mark again, and he was about to board the plane and he had said that Kevin had died. That was uh, a sobering moment um, for anybody. And uh, I did, I think, myself, I was on my own, I shed a tear, not really for me, but for Kevin, for Susan, for Helen, for Stephen, and for Mark, um, his family, you know. Um, Kevin always will live in everybody's head here as a brilliant poet, uh, an academic, uh, an artist, a wonderful orator, a wonderful composer. Um, he'll always live in our hearts because he was just a lovely person, um, a family member and someone that was very helpful to people that he reached out to. Um, about 10 years ago, before I finish up, um, Paul Fahey, who was the uh, Arts Festival director at the time, um, called me. They were doing a reading in St. Nicholas's Church of the Dead. It was kind of half production, half reading. A very lavish thing, actually, very, very nice. And uh, I had been touring Ireland with a production of a Frank Patterson tribute um, with another tenor, Sean Costello, and a soprano. And uh, I had sang a piece in it called The Lass of Ockram, which is a part of the text of the, of the film. And he asked, would I sing that little piece at the appropriate time during the evening? So I was delighted to do that. Um, but he also said, would I sing a piece, uh, a more kind of hard hitting or a more guttural piece, maybe in a foreign language, to open the actual uh, reading? So I went through a few different pieces uh, with Paul and we settled on a piece called Una Fortiva Lagrima from uh, Lissier de Mora by Donizetti. It was written in 1821. And uh, one of the reasons I went for that was because James Joyce, who composed The Dead, fancied himself as a bit of a tenor. And he was a great friend of uh, the wonderful Irish tenor, Count John McCormack. And McCormack always encouraged him to you know, enter Fela and so, so on, and he was he wasn't the best tenor in the world, but he was enthusiastic, let's say. Um, his writing was much better. Um, so, you know, we talked about her, Susan and I, and um, I suppose I got a phone call three days later after that event, and it was from Kevin. This is 10 years ago now. And it was, I didn't recognize the number, you know, I just answered the number. Oh, it's just Kevin here, and oh, how are you, Kev? And, the whole lot of chat, and I said, did you have a great night? He said, I just wanted to, these are his words now, uh, not mine. He said, I just wanted to congratulate you on that wonderful piece that you sang. He said, everybody was talking about it at the event. And that was, like Alan said earlier, a huge fill-up for me at the time, because as a performance artist, I don't compose anything, I don't write anything. I am just a mouthpiece for other people's work. And sometimes you can feel a little bit fraudulent in that way. I know you shouldn't, but you can do, you know. And he made me feel like a real artist that time. Um, and I really always remembered that, you know. But that was Kevin. He was a very generous person like that. Um, I'm going to sing a verse of that, the last part of it. I just want to thank Susan very much for inviting me here today. This wonderful event, all these brilliant speakers. Uh, James and this wonderful place on Tyverk that I sang in for many, many years. And, you know, it's just an emotional time for his family. And, but these are cathartic events, aren't they? And when I think of my own parents, and I often say to my children, I talk about my mother and father all the time because when I do that, I feel like that they're still with me and still alive in my heart and my head. So this is just a verse of Una Fortiva Lagrima, and this is for Kevin. Una Fortiva Lagrima Del suave cor sentir I miei sosti Confondere per 
poco a sua e sospir e palpiti palpiti sentir con a fondre i miei con suoi sospir cielo si può morir di più non chiedo non chiedo Si può morire di più non chiedo, non chiedo. Si può Si può morire Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank Dotson. And now, finally, with the not considerable task of following that, is Des Kilban. Des is the head of Des Productions based in Galway City. He's directed and produced a number of feature-length documentaries for TG Carr, as well as many short documentaries, including A Fighting Heart, winner of Best Sports Doc at the Celtic Media Festival in Cornwall in 2014, and An Auxiliary to Murder, which was broadcast in TG Carr in 2022. Des met Kevin while attending one of the Overedge sessions around 2007. He was studying film and TV course in GMIT, now ATU, at the time, and he made a short film based on Kevin and Susan, rhyming couplet, and Kevin is here to introduce that film, which will be the concluding part of this wonderful tribute. And we have to say thank you to everybody who has been here on stage for a remarkable morning and afternoon. And we definitely feel that Kevin is very close to us at the moment. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, James. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Susan and Danny for inviting me here today for this very special event for Kevin. Um, I met Kevin around 2007 when my partner Ola Higgins was, writing, was reading at Over the Edge and I became a regular at those events. Um, and as I was attending the, uh, Over the Edge, I could see the special relationship between Susan and Kevin. It just shone through and I thought, there are what wonderful people, and what would be great if I could maybe make a documentary. And, and um, I was studying film and TV in GMIT at the time, ATU now. And my graduation year was the following year, and I approached Kevin and Susan to see would they be interested in being the subjects of my graduation film. And thankfully, they readily agreed, and uh, so Ryan Couplet was born. Um, it was a pleasure to work with my fellows students out on such a film uh, with such wonderful and talented people. It was a pleasure to, to, to film Kevin and Susan. I just remember it just really one of the happiest uh, experience I ever had making a film. And it, uh, it is still one of my favourite films. And I've been very lucky to make lots and lots of films, but this is still ranks as one of my, my favourite. And um, it did pretty well on the um, film festival circuit around Ireland. Uh, it was screened at the uh, Gowie Funfla, at Pat McCabe's Flat Lake Festival in Monaghan, and at the Skyward Film Festival 
uh, in Clifton. Um, yeah, uh, so um, I hope you enjoy the film uh, about two very special and talented people, and of course, never forgetting I I Ziggy the cat. <laughs> Thank you. And in water, in darkness, in grace. I have no doubt that my wish to thrash everything out now in you know, sometimes grotesque detail would uh, be something that Susan could, you know, could wait until tomorrow. So that's, that's a dynamic that certainly uh, um, exists um, uh, between us. Well, the writing and the teaching and the readings, it's all, it all comes together. And it's something we can put all of our love and all of our enthusiasm into. And on a good day, all of the love and the enthusiasm comes back to us, um, and we have a lot of good days. You know, I think we, we, we balance each other very, very well. You know, it's, it's, I mean, and it's a, a joy to, to uh, work and be with Susan. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a really uh, special night. I think six years of over the age is, is, is just fantastic. And I want to say that the library service is really delighted to be associated with the work of Susan and um, or Kevin. Um, I think that poetry should be on the streets and I think that um, Kevin and Susan are introducing it to everybody on the streets of Galway through events um, such as this and creating a fantastic um, audience. So I'd like to call on my colleague uh, Maureen Morden to make a special presentation to, to, to Susan. for Kevin, but I didn't realise it was also the 10th anniversary, oh. so this is, a, um, this is a nice bottle of uh, Spanish red wine that I hope you'll both enjoy to celebrate together. Oh, okay. Poets are just like everyone else. Today over breakfast, husband and I discussed the rhyme scheme of Petrarchan sonnets its merits relative to the Shakespearean style. I sipped my cappuccino thoughtfully. Husband stroked our cat. It was an edifying conversation. After which, husband and I scaled the drapes and batted an invisible <laughs> birds. Our cat sighed, tidied his whiskers, and kept reading The Guardian. <laughs> So on so many occasions down at Over the Edge, the library staff eventually indicated that it was time to leave the building and we all figured, what a shame, but we'll be back. This was a wonderful um, event. Thank you to Susan, thank you to Danny and to all the contributors. Thank you to the Thai York. Thank you to yourselves for being a fabulous audience. We will never forget Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.